Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to see so many people here uh, on a Saturday morning. Um, and I think that's testament maybe to the urgency uh, of the topic that we're here to discuss and also uh, to the range of speakers that we've assembled uh, to try to help us to think about that topic. Our topic is housing, the housing crisis, and our question is, what can we do now? Uh, in other words, we want to think about this problem, a problem which is, uh, I would say, big, urgent, and complicated uh, in its nature. Um, and it seems, therefore, like a topic that something as big and compl complex as a university should somehow be able to engage with uh, and to tackle. Uh, and specifically, um, this school, uh, which is now a school that incorporates architecture, planning, and environmental policy, uh, some of the disciplines which are key, really, to um, the, the, the whole question uh, of housing, housing provision, housing design, and so on, that those disciplines coming together in a single school, which is something that's just happened this year, seemed like also a good moment for us to try to think about this issue uh, of housing. Um, its currency, I suppose, is it, it, we, we read about approaches to housing, aspects of the problems that currently face the, hu the housing from homelessness to affordable housing to um, rent through tenancy, that all of these, these aspects of that problem are in the news every day. Only yesterday we had the recommendations coming forth from the Committee on Housing and Homelessness, some, I think, 20-plus recommendations encompassing everything from the need to increase the social housing stock to the need for a security of tenure and so on and so forth. And already I know among our speakers in the run-up to this event there's been some discussion about um, the adequacy or not of a lot of those recommendations or the appropriateness or not of a lot of those recommendations. So um, in our school this year, uh, some of you will already have seen um, the exhibition of work by our first-year master's students who have been in the studio run by Emma uh, Scanlon, Orla Murphy and others called Rising Home, which is trying to think about and how architects can respond um, to the provision of high quality, um, low cost housing. Um, and that's something that's going to continue over a number of years. We've also started to work with and make connections with colleagues in planning within the school, but also in social policy, in law, in business, and around the university to think about how we can come together to start to devise some sort of approach uh, to, or some kind of contribution to um, the solving of this housing crisis. Um, and um, I suppose uh, um, beyond that, uh, we, w we also see um, that we would like the university to be involved not just in a sort of passive way, but also in a very active way. And so our aspiration is that we will get involved in a very direct way uh, in working on housing design. And as part of that, we're also going to be introducing a master's in housing design uh, led by Michael Pike, which will be coming on stream uh, in the coming year. That's a research master's. So there's a range of things that we can do, we feel, within this school. But we also wanted to use this event to hear from other voices, voices beyond uh, as well as within the school, um, and get some of those different perspectives on the housing crisis. Um, we're delighted to have with us this morning um, also uh, Shelley McNamara, who's going to respond to our speakers at the end. And I'm part it's particularly appropriate that Shelley would be here because, in part, this event was sparked by a conversation that Shelley and Yvonne had on the occasion of the UCD Alumni Awards last November where Peter McVerry, our first speaker, was being given an award um, because he's a graduate of the science program in UCD. And so he was their alumni awardee for the um, evening. And uh, Shelley and Yvonne spoke to Joe Carty, the principal of the College of Science, uh, and asked him why, in the context of Peter McVerry being given this award, that UCD wasn't being more active in trying to find ways in which to address the housing. So in a way, Shelley, you're the person who's responsible <laughs> for at least some of what's going on at, at the moment. Um, and so Shelley will be responding to our speakers at the end, and then we'll have a chance to open out the discussion uh, to the floor for questions and so on. 
mindful uh, of certain other events that are happening later in the day. We're wanting to finish around about one o'clock, um, at which stage there'll be a chance, there'll be picnics in the quadrangle and there'll be a chance to look at the exhibition of housing work uh, and so on. My job is really just to keep things moving and keep things uh, on time. Um, and so what we're going to have is a series of short presentations um, from our, our, our well, seven speakers with six contributions, uh, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll open up the discussion. Our first speaker uh, we're delighted to have with us is Peter McVerry. Everybody will know Peter McVerry for his work on homelessness, um, which dates back over 40 years really now. Um, he's been working um, and advocating for the needs of the homeless in Dublin and beyond. And his work with the Father Peter McVerry Trust uh, I think has been exemplary and an inspiration, I think, to everybody um, concerned with uh, questions um, of, uh, concerned with uh, the problem of homelessness and how it can be solved. And so I'd ask you to join me in welcoming uh, Peter McVerry. Good morning, everybody, and I'll try and stick to my allotted five minutes. <laughs> Homelessness is obviously, it's the most extreme and uh, visible consequence of a dysfunctional housing system. And rough sleeping is the most extreme and visible consequence of homelessness. But we have a totally dysfunctional housing system at the moment. The three sectors in the housing system, private housing, social housing, and private rented, are all in crisis at the same time. Normally, in a functioning housing system, if one sector falls into crisis, the other two can compensate. But today, all three sectors, the demand uh, far exceeds supply, and so there is no uh, flexibility for any of the sectors to cope with the, uh, with, the, with the problems that are created, and therefore the problem of homelessness is, is increasing. The scale of the problem is horrendous. Uh, right through 2014 and 2015, in Dublin alone, five new people became homeless every single day. And that's since the first, uh, since January of this year, that's gone up to eight new people becoming homeless every single day. And that's apart from the families. In 2013, seven or eight families a month were becoming homeless. In 2015, it was 70 families a month were becoming homeless. And this year so far, it's an average of 85 families a month uh, becoming homeless. We have over 1,000 families now living in emergency accommodation with over 2,000 children. And the consequences for those children particularly are horrific. The children are physically uh, <coughs> being damaged because they're eating out of chippers for up to two years. Uh, they are emotionally damaged because of the stress and they are it's educationally damaged because you can't go to school and study if you're, education, if you're stressed out all the time. Anyway, the, the, uh, the solutions, the, I, I, I fully accept and, rec and agree with the recommendations of the Oireachtas Committee, and I think the most important recommendation was that we have to build 50,000 social houses over the next five years. The problem we face today with social housing is, goes back 20 years. It goes back to the Celtic Tiger years when the Fianna Fáil government of that time decided that social housing should be provided by the private sector and in particular by the private rented sector. And so they provided the rent allowance to allow low-income families to pay the rents and the cost of the rent allowance went from something like 32 million a year up to 500 million a year. So that uh, ideological decision to effectively abandon social housing uh, has led us to the position that we're in. And there is no solution to the social housing crisis today except to build social housing. Uh, Low-income families do not want to be in the private rented sector by and large. And their big objection to the private rented sector is a lack of security of tenure. They can be thrown out at very, very short notice. All the landlord has to do is to say he's selling his house or his granny is coming home from England and he needs it to, to house her and you are evicted and there's nothing you can do about it. Some landlords are using that as an excuse just to get rid of you and bring in another tenant at a much higher, higher rent. 
So the building of social housing, that's going to be extraordinarily challenging. We're already halfway through this year, and uh, I'd say the number of social housing units that have come on stream would be in the hundreds rather than the thousands. Uh, so we're really looking at 12,500 social housing units to be built each year over the next four years, and that would exceed anything we have ever done in the history of this state. The, uh, so it's very challenging. A number of the other recommendations, they were made, and indeed the last minister, Alan Kelly, uh, wanted to introduce them. One is rent controls, limiting rent increases to some sort of index, such as the consumer price index. Alan Kelly wanted to do that but the Minister for Finance wouldn't let him. Uh, increasing the rent supplement to, uh, to the level at which the market uh, exists, the market rates. Alan Kelly wanted to do that and Joan Burton wouldn't let him. So there, the problem with this, and I, I would just finish on this, uh, the problem that Simon Coveney has is he can accept all these recommendations but unless he gets the cooperation of a significant number of other departments and agencies, his hands are tied. Uh, the, there, this is a, a problem that no one department can solve. The Department of Finance has a key role to play in this. The Department of Social Protection, who control the rent supplement, has a key role to play in this. The Department of Health has a key role because some homeless people, a small minority, let it be said, but some homeless people have addiction and mental health problems, and it's very difficult to solve their homelessness unless they have access to uh, treatment. Uh, so the, the, uh, the local authorities have a role to play in this. Alan Kelly wanted Dublin City Council to renovate an empty block of flats in Devony Gardens to be used as emergency accommodation for homeless families, and Dublin City Council told them to get lost. So they have a key role to play, and actually the local authorities, it seems to me, don't want to build social housing. They've had their uh, problems with big estates like Tala and, uh, and Ballymun and Valley Fermat in the past, and they don't want to go back to having, having to manage big social housing estates. Uh, and so there's going to be a huge uh, need to persuade them to, uh, to, to come and, 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 and fulfill their role, their key role, in addressing this whole problem uh, of, of, of homelessness and housing. So we have a huge crisis. The number of family, the number of households on the social housing waiting list, it's certainly well over 100,000 at the moment. Back in 1996, it was 25,000. Today, it's well over 100,000, 20 years later. Uh, this year is supposed to be the new count of the number of households on the social housing waiting list. I, <coughs> I haven't heard a word about that count. I don't know if it's taken place. I suspect there may be pressure to try and uh, delay it or stifle it or abandon it because the numbers are going to be absolutely horrific. But the new social housing uh, waiting list uh, count should be out this year and I think it will... Uh, it will really put a uh, huge pressure on government to continue to, to, to address this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, one of the people, I suppose, who's uh, I suppose, tasked with responding to or advising on um, the, this this very difficult crisis that Peter has outlined so vividly uh, is Sarah Neary. Who, um, Sarah Neary was uh, recently appointed as housing advisor uh, in the Department of, is it still the Department of Environment and Local Government or it is, is it now the moment, Department of yeah. Housing, Planning and Local Government, something? It takes ministerial order <laughs> to change the title. Okay, so what's currently the Department of Environment and Local Government. And Sarah is an engineer uh, by training. She also has an MBA from UCD. Uh, and previous to this role, she worked as a senior advisor working on um, the building regulations. Um, so I think she's well versed in um, dealing with very complex uh, and seemingly intractable issues. And I'm delighted that we have Sarah here uh, this morning in her new role to talk to us. So please join me in welcoming Sarah Neary. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hugh, and uh, thanks for the invite to come along here today. Um, 
I, I just uh, when you mentioned the, the name of the department, I suppose the uh, we are the Department of Environment at the moment, but the uh, the new name will be Housing, Planning and Local Government, and I suppose that reflects the, the focus and the commitment to to address the housing uh, problem, and indeed even internally the uh, department has been restructured. There's now two housing divisions and a planning division, and those three divisions collectively um, are, are addressing a number of actions in relation to the housing action plan and, and looking, from, looking at it from a holistic point of view. Uh, I suppose just for the few minutes that I have this morning, um, I was going to use a sentence out of the department's own statement of strategy. Um, I think it's, a, it's a, a useful framework in terms of analyzing the problems with the housing market at the moment and also creating a vision of, of where, we, where we want to be or where we should be. Um, the sentence is, every household should have access to secure good quality housing suited to their needs and at an affordable price in a sustainable community. Um, for me, it captures the five big elements, uh, access or supply of housing, quality housing, people's needs, affordability and sustainable communities. And I, I was just going to say a few things about, about each of them. Um, the first issue, access to housing, and has, uh, as Peter has um, already explained, in effect we've had eight years of little or no private or social housing. As a result, there's a significant pent-up demand for social and affordable housing. And as well as that, we've got an ongoing demand for housing um, due to the economy recovering, thankfully, population increasing, inward migration, and the emerging trends of smaller households. The unmet demand has contributed to a significant increase in rental costs, and as Peter has explained, um, the risk of homelessness. The social housing strategy of 2020 uh, sets a target of 35 new social housing units. They're delivered through the new built local authority and AHB um, delivery, acquisitions, turnkeys, park fives and voids. Um, in addition, a further 75,000 households could be accommodated with supports in the private rental sector. Um, the success of the social housing strategy relies on the private, uh, the private sector delivery. It's estimated that 25,000 houses are needed annually, and this represents a doubling of the supply around the country and a quadrupling of the supply in Dublin. It gives you an idea of the scale. So how do we increase supply? We need to stimulate house building. Um, it's worth noting that there's 4,400 housing sites or, or housing units on active sites at the moment in Dublin yet there's planning permission for 25,000. Uh, so why aren't those 25,000 delivering units? Um, a, a, another figure then, there's zoned land for 88,000. So the problem isn't planning permission or zoned land. There, there's capacity there. And we look later under a different topic as to why, uh, maybe why they're not being built out and, and what can be done to activate these sites. Another method of increasing supply uh, is to look at vacant units. The census of 2011 recorded a very large number of vacant uh, housing units around the country. Uh, these represent a fast and uh, relatively cheap method of bringing new units to the market um, uh, for use. So uh, another, another area that we need to focus on. Uh, in terms of, back to our statement then, the second element of the vision is uh, quality of the housing supplied. I suppose it's very interesting to see the workshop across the quadrangle there and a lot of the, uh, I just read one of the articles in your newspaper, very, very, um, very current, very applied. It's, it's really interesting to see that um, coming, from, uh, coming from the academic think tank that's here. Um, while it's important to deliver, deliver housing in a short time frame, it's equally important and I think everybody here agrees to get the quality right. The house building standards, I suppose, are predominantly set through the building regulations and the apartment guidelines there that you've, you referenced earlier. Um, the reform of the building co control system in 2014 established a practice of the production and lodgement of design uh, and compliance documentation at an early stage, mandatory inspections on site during construction, and then the statutory certification of design and um, construction by registered uh, construction professionals like, like yourselves and builders um, and then a register where those certificates are publicly available. Uh, this reform has empowered professionals and engendered accountability throughout the supply chain and facilitated improved compliance with the building regulations. 
The strengthening of the building control function then at local authorities is also key to improving the efficiency, consistency and oversight of construction activity and compliance with the building regulations. Um, and these measures are in place to improve and ensure quality construction into the future. Um, if we move then back to our statement and on to the third element, people's needs. Um, I, I think it was referred to earlier about the need to think differently and yeah, not just repeat what we've done in the past. And I suppose currently the three bed semi is the most common, most desirable housing unit in the market. And everybody will tell you that and a lot of people accept it. And I don't know how many people are prepared to actually question it out there. Maybe this room is a, a very select group of people who do, but in a general sense. However, we, we can see the trends and the research to show that even by 2018, 57% of all households in the Dublin region will be one and two bed person households, and a further 18% will be three bedroom, three person households as opposed to three bedroom. And this represents our aging population, smaller family sizes, single parent families, students, transient workers, and young people. Um, the statistics also on the, the over 65s, we have half a million at the moment, that's about 12% of our population, but by 2040, it'll be 22% of our population, 1.4 million. Um, we need to cater for our needs going forward. And this opportunity exists now to um, have a greater mix of typologies, um, a greater mix of tenure and a better functioning rental market, um, and ultimately greater movement um, as a real choice of supply presents itself. Um, the fourth element of the vision then was affordability and arguably the most significant. Um, the central bank rules on mortgage lending effectively cap the average affordable house price. Uh, industry figures would suggest that the actual cost of delivery of a, of a housing unit exceeds this price. And this imbalance has resulted in the affordable residential sector just not being, um, no, nothing being built in it and no supply. Um, and if we go back to those figures at the beginning, the 27,000 units that have planning permission, this might be the reason why not. Um, I suppose last week, Minister Coveney announced the establishment of a local infrastructure fund of 200 million, and this would, uh, this is a fund to um, provide physical infrastructure like roads, um, amenities, bridges, whatever is needed in order to um, activate either private or public lands for housing. And obviously reducing the overall costs and bringing some of those projects to be more economically viable. Um, in addition, the active land management policy recommended by NESC uh, over many years now is another mechanism for creating a more sustainable housing supply and stable market condition. Um, the fifth element then, our last piece of the jigsaw, is the sustainable community piece. Uh, unfortunately, much of the recent housing supply um, has comprised of one-off houses around the country or the uh, sprawling commuter belt around the urban centres. Patterns of settlement and neighbourhood design and density have always been a challenge in, in, in Ireland. The promotion of sustainable communities has been enshrined in policy for, for a long time now and implemented through many best practice guidelines and policy documents. Sustainable communities are areas where land is used efficiently and there's very high quality urban design um, and effective integration of physical and social services. And these combine to present places where people want to live. Um, the advantages are many, and, and I suppose I'm preaching to the converted here really, um, greater uh, generational integration, greater independence for young and old, um, better use of public transports, of amenities, shops, schools, um, better economics, um, less car dependencies, etc. Regeneration and bringing back vacant units into use um, has the potential to revitalise our cities, towns and villages, and policies such as these are inherently supportive of the um, sustainable communities policy and bolster local, local communities. Um, just maybe referencing back to some of the, um, the uh, comments that were made earlier, and I suppose much of what, uh, what I, I'm talking about is very centred and very grounded in good design, and it's really, for me, it would be a, 
a key to success into the future, whether it's at the unit level, at the community level, or at the national level. It's all about clever and good design. There's, there'll be many people involved in, the, in solving this crisis, and it's all about cooperation um, at government level and, and uh, throughout the industry and the sector. Um, but I think there's a very important role for informed, talented, creative people um, to provide uh, or to design good quality housing to meet Irish people's needs at an affordable price in a sustainable community where we can all flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that very lucid uh, and comprehensive uh, overview. You ended by speaking about the need for clever and good design, so it seems appropriate that our next speaker uh, is Derek Tynan, one of our most distinguished graduates, a very distinguished architect, who last year won the um, silver medal, RII silver medal for housing for the third time, which I think means he gets to keep it, um, uh, for, his, for his housing in Santry Domain. Um, so we're delighted to have uh, Derek with us this morning uh, to talk again from his point of view about housing. Thank you very much. That was a very generous, um, very generous introduction. Um, and I'm conscious that after however many years in practice that the total number of dwellings, including student accommodation, that we've actually constructed is somewhat shy of 1,000 units. So in the context of what we're talking about in terms of numbers, you know, it's, it's necessary to have uh, consciousness of that. And in that sense, and, and with, with great uh, adm admiration of uh, uh, Eddie Conroy's work in relation to George Herbert Sims, who was the city architect between 1932 and 48, who built or supervised from the market of its blocks and various other things in the city to Crumlin and Cabra, I'm conscious that he built, or was built under his direction, 17,000. So that's the scale of kind of initiative in a certain sense that we need. So in the tradition of, of architecture, I tried to pull this into, I'm sorry, the other thing to say is that there's no self-promotion today, so there's no uh, slides, um, uh, so you'll be saved that. Um, so I'm gonna try and do it in the tradition of the five points. So first, I, the first thing I think we need to do is be honest about the time scale. Um, this crisis has, has been said, has been long in the, in, in the making, and in the immediate short term, in terms of the idea about what should we immediately do, as asked in the question, I, don't, I think that the issues, and as, as Peter McVeary has mentioned, about homelessness are to do with social policy, rent control, uh, financial assistance, etc., to get us over the short term of people becoming homeless. It, the, the, you know, the time scale, if you take a 50 unit or 50 dwelling um, uh, development to build it, even if you had the survey today, if you got through design and onto site in 12 months, which is very short, and construction took 15 to 18 months, you're two and a half to three years before we can deliver, starting today, something for people to move into. So that's the reality, and I think the first thing we need to do is be honest about the time scale of what we can do. The second thing is that in responding to a housing crisis, that I don't think that we should jump to fast conclusions. And I think that if we look at the areas for regeneration, that have been, been regenerated over the last number of years, whether that be Dublin and Ballymun, whether it be Knocknaheeny or the Glen and Cork or parts of Limerick, they arose out of previous overly fast responses to housing crises, which left us with a legacy that we have to, had to deal with in the immediate, in the, in the recent past. So I have, ability, I, have, I, have, I have faith in the ability of government to respond. I think that you know, initiatives, whether it be rural electrification the Cork Dublin gas pipeline or free education were all uh, um, kind of initiatives by government and I think we have to actually believe that that can happen again. That's point one. Second point is keep the faith. Um, and not in the St. Paul, Pauline kind of version where he's run the race, but rather in the Irish version of having a belief and holding on to an idea. And I think it's important that, and again it's not an, an, an immediate action, that we recognise the contribution that we can make as architects. Over the last 20 or 25 years, there's been an extraordinary, through the Department of the Environment, extraordinary um, uh, uh, suite of standards, and I think it would be unfortunate if they were to get completely eradicated. I think over that period, what I call the heroic period, and I, I talk, uh, you know, kind of Sean Antoine O'Murray's book on 1990 to 2010, Dublin Architecture, you know, shows the quality of things that were made 
of uh, a tradition of creating places, districts, neighbourhoods, etc. And I don't think that we should forget all of that. I think in terms of quality and sustainability, we have to remain there. In terms of the housing guidelines, uh, there are many who believe that the, uh, the winter solstice of last year was marked by the darkest day in housing design when Mr. Kelly, the previous minister, published his guidelines. Um, and I think there are certain aspects of that. Uh, I think it was heavy handed. I know it has to do with affordability. I uh, have concerns about the issue of, of, of the reduction of dual aspect in terms of longer, se longer uh, sustainability of housing. And the main issues are to do with affordability. And even in the war, interwar years in this country, we had subsidization of uh, housing, whether that be, you know, and I think we need to recognize that and that the, you know, the, the reduction of floor areas is of itself not, you know, the, the, the panacea to where we are. I think as architects, in terms of keeping the faith, we need to remain as advocates. We need to maintain a belief and have ambition about our vanity, community, quality, and lives. And I think that's the second thing we have to do um, in terms of what we can immediately do, is just keep the faith. The third thing is innovation and design. And I think we are dealing with new realities in terms of you know, smaller units, the demographics that Sarah has mentioned, household type, families, apartments, etc. And that has implications for access and unit, ar uh, unit arrangements, for density, and for affordability. I think we need to move to open plan typologies, and I know there is work going on on this. It's interesting that the housing agency, which has just published a, a, a call for, for a study for, um, to deal with the new, or to examine the new regulations, um, has one part of it which actually talks about the, uh, the um, change in the fire regulation. We, we need to adopt BS 991, which gives far, far greater flexibility, which removes corridor solutions, and we need fire engineered solutions to actually move this forward. I think one, and, and there are issues that attached to that, um, uh, which is to do with cost, um, but I think those could be addressed. Um, and we have, for example, we're, uh, we're quoted 25,000 for a large apartment to actually put sprinklers into it, but we've got that down to a local suppression system of six or for six grand at the moment. So I think there's a, an issue that can happen there. And I think one of the things that the department could do to actually push that agenda is to have a series of workshops um, to bring the fire officers into that and to actually move that agenda forward across the fire service so that we can uh, move that forward. I think that would be one thing that we could do in innovation and design that could be done now if the department uh, asks for that to be done and if it directs that it can be done, then it can be done and we can move to a more flexible form of open plan typology uh, which will great, uh, allow for greater affordability uh, and greater flexibility in terms of design. When you look at, you know, you're in looking at housing typologies in um, in Holland or in the Netherlands or in Germany, and you say, how do they do that? They do it because they're not stuck on BS 5581, whatever it was, that we've had. And so there's a far greater flexibility that arises from that. That's something that we can do now. The fourth one, fourth, well, it's only five, so this is the fourth, is build exemplars. Um, and I've talked about the time scale before, but I think we need to, you know, the, I don't think, believe the solution to where we are is modular bungalows. I don't think that's going to help us in terms of density. Um, rapid build technology, I'm not sure how that's actually worked out, but we need to move forward. Um, and I think it's worth saying that in terms of local authorities and housing programs, that the commissioning of social and affordable housing by local authorities um, was a, a useful program, and that also other bodies, such as um, whether it was Docklands or Temple Bar or whatever, led to innovation in housing by having a radical commissioning policy. And I'll come back to the question of procurement in a second. I think, in terms of what we might do, in terms of building exemplars, that the department and the local authorities should select 20 projects. Um, 10 brown urban field, brown, brown field urban sites, 10 edge lower density ones. Take 20 projects, 1,000 units, commit 150 million to it, and say, let's build exemplar housing for th in three years on those sites. And to actually take that as with a fast track approval process to the department and design review process also with the department that could be external if, they, if that's difficult. But I think you could actually move the whole um, argument forward very quickly and it would be something which, as all politicians like, it would catch the public imagination. And I think that would be very useful. The last thing I have to say is about procurement. 
I think we need, if we are to address where we are in terms of housing, if we are to use the talents that we've talked about um, in terms of architects and, uh, and the, the, the various other sectors, I think we need a radical rethink of procurement because procurement does not allow us, either on professional design teams or on construction, to respond to the demands that we're dealing with. Um, we are, as a practice, my practice, uh, we are very lucky because we built social housing seven years ago. As a result of that, we can still qualify for many of the frameworks which have actually come up in the last year. If you're outside of that and next year we'll be outside of it, you won't qualify for those frameworks anymore. So that's the first thing. The second thing, the process of appointing design teams. Um, without wishing to speak out of turn, we're on one of the programs of the Office of Government Procurement for uh, the south of the country, which was uh, called for an SAQ, came out in February of last year. Um, we signed a contract about a month ago, and we haven't actually been asked to look at anything yet. That means it's 18 months to actually um, uh, appoint a design team. We simply can't let that happen and it be that long. And that's to be the central place wherever there's other smaller frameworks as well. So I think that you know, we just need to do something else in terms of some radical overhaul of procurement and a procurement of design teams. The second thing is that the qualification for those keep, keeps out, and I, I suspect, for example, that if you look at the Office of Government Procurement um, list, that you'll find that, the, say, that there's probably 15 practices in total across all of the, all of the frameworks. And if actually you were to try and build 25,000, they couldn't actually do it because they don't have the capacity. And the manner of procurement at the moment keeps out of the system young practices uh, who could well, as I've said before, you know, deal with 25 to 50 dwelling um, uh, projects without any difficulty whatsoever. And if necessary, the RII could mentor them in some kind of fashion, right? So I think we need to overhaul it, open it up, and let uh, people do it. And I've suggested before at the conference this year that the RII itself should, with the department, um, select five sites um, for 25 to 50 dwellings with a guaranteed commission to build and have, have a housing competition in two months for those and get on with it. So I do believe that there are significant things that we can do um, in terms of how we move this forward as architects and make an appropriate contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Derek, um, for managing to sound reasonable and radical uh, at the same time. Um, our next speakers we're delighted to have with us um, from the Irish Housing Network, which is a network that's been set up by, by a collection of housing and homeless groups fighting the ongoing um, housing and homeless crisis. And so we're delighted to have from that network Alan Driscoll and Ashling Hederman. Thank you. Thank you. I'd uh, just like to start by uh, saying that we're very happy to be here to speak as me and Ashland both as former students of UCD through access programs. We're delighted to be uh, invited back and throw our tailbones word into the, the housing. I'll spend uh, a minute and give us a quick overview of what the housing network is about. It's basically an umbrella group of different housing action committees, groups, based in uh, Wexford, Cork, Kildare, Dublin 8, Dublin 12, Dublin 7, also in North Dublin Bay, which is the name of our constituency. So that it stretched from Santry, which is just beside Ballymun, all the way down to the coast, encompassing Clontarf, Hout, and small parts of Malahoyed and Port Marnock. So it's a massive geographical area, sorry about that. It's a massive geographical area, but we've, we find most of our work is based in the greater Kowlock area, which is probably a dozen to 15 large working class estates of 1,000 to 1,200 houses in each estate. We're a community-based group where, where grassroots, most people involved are suffering housing issues. We, we walk on the grounds of running support 
groups for those that are homeless, advocacy, and we try to empower the homeless themselves <coughs> to, to better their, their situation. So now, it's a hard fight to, to do these things. Access to information, it'd be one of our major problems. One person can be told one thing, someone else will be told something completely different. So, because we've dealt with so many cases, we it was like putting a jigsaw together. We eventually came to, this is kind of the way it works. And we, we also, when, when we feel it's it's needed, we would perform what we'd call a kind of direct action. We, as a group, would go to the DCC and we'd we'd have the families involved. They'd bring their kids and we'd all roll up 20 or 30 of us and demand to see the management. And we won't leave till the questions we have are answered. Now, I'm not a lover of doing this, but unfortunately, sometimes it has to be done because the situations people are in are dire sometimes and they're caught between a rock and a hard place and with living circumstances like this a, a lot of mental health issues and things can come into it so people feel that they have no other option than to, if they have tried email and phoning that direct action has to be taken. So uh, I'd like to give us a few minutes on a bit about homelessness and then our thoughts on social housing. On homelessness force, the majority of what people would say is like the visible homeless in Dublin City and all, I believe that what services have been massively cut since the recession drug and alcohol addiction programs, mental health things. Then, then you have also specific communities that are homeless, like travelers. And then there, there seems to be, uh, we've come across a lot of cases of people in the LGBT community becoming homeless. And then a lot of the time, the hostels don't really suit them because of their lifestyle. There can be bullying and things like that involved just because you're different. So uh, I think on the visible homeless front, services is a major thing for them. For the not so visible homeless, which would be people in emergency accommodation, I think some of the main things that would affect them is the standards of the accommodation. There, there seems to be no standard across the board. One hotel might be a brand new hotel. Everything is okay to a certain extent. It's very like what Father McFerry said. You'd have no cooking facilities. So if you have two or three children, you wake up in the morning, you can have a fluid breakfast, bring the children to school. But when you bring the children home from school, you have no cooking facilities. So it ends, the children are eating a lot of fast food or living on pot noodles or stuff like that. Some of the accommodation is very substandard. Uh, what, what would be normally classed as paying customers would not stay in these rooms. The, a lot of these places are years old and in need of refurbishment, and it seems to be that people will say, well, I'll open this up to the homeless and the DCC will pay, because in some cases they're paying almost a thousand pound a week to keep a family in the hotel, and uh, the amounts of money being spent are, are massive, and there's certain people in this country are making an awful lot of money out of the homeless crisis. Do you know, I, I, I read a piece in uh, the Times the other day saying because of the homeless crisis, we should build more hotels to house the homeless because there's not enough hotels now for tourists when they come to Dublin. 
because they're being taken over by the homeless, where I would say build houses and not build hotels. I'll move on now to uh, our views on social housing. I, I welcomed the Oireachtas report yesterday, but I believe we're over 100,000 on waiting lists, and if the government are to deliver 50,000 homes within five years, at the, the right people are becoming homeless, there'll be 50, another 50,000 homeless within that five years to take down 50,000. So what about the 100,000 that's already on the list? I, I honestly think that it maybe should be doubled or, or trebled. Now, we know this is a massive ass, and local authorities now are in a position where they're more <coughs> management companies. The days of them having armies of workers and coming to Greenfield sites, like when I moved to Kowlock as a child, it was a Greenfield site, Talla, Clondalkin, building massive sprawling estates. They want to get away from that. Now, I know from living in that area, we, we've always had problems with crime and stuff like that, but I believe as well that was the way it was handled. There was no services you were put out on the edge of the city where I think lessons have been learned over the last few years. So I think that consultation within communities for development is imperative, especially when dealing with architects, developers, that there must be a a broad consultation with the community to build sustainable communities. I also believe that land banks, which DCC have five land banks, so I can name off the top of my head now, that are, that are looking to go ahead for development. Oh, Devney Gardens in Dublin 7, uh, Michael's Estate in Inchicore, one on the Oscar Trainer Road where, where we live in Kewlock, there's another one down on the Malahide Road, Bell Camp, which is, is Kewlock as well. And then the fifth is in Ballyfermer. There's also massive Nama land banks, which supposedly the people own. So we are of the view that public land should be used for public good. And that the PPP model hasn't proved very successful. In the past, private developers want to build for profit. They're not in the business of socially housing people. They want to build to make money. I believe with the massive land banks that has held that land being probably 40% of the price of building a house, if the land was given over, there could be thousands of houses built each year. We, we have thousands of unemployed people from the building trade that would be only too happy to go forward and uh, build. There's also there's finance there. There's, there's been finance proposals from the credit union, the strategic investment fund, Irish pension funds have said that, that they had put up money. So, I think that the housing stock is being pushed into privatisation. And the days of the government looking after the less well-off in society is being pushed out to the margins. So uh, I'll finish up with that, and thanks very much. Hey, my name's Ashton. I'm also part of um, North Dublin Bay Housing Crisis Community. Um, we started up two years ago today. It's our anniversary, can you believe it? Um, so basically, following on from Alan, uh, well done. Um, I just wanted to go into a little bit about kind of the private rented sector and the mortgages, because I haven't really heard that being mentioned about those that are in mortgage arrears or the chart of repossessions within the homes. Um, uh, lately, what we've been seeing is that there's 100,000 homes at risk of repossessions. This will push families back into the private rental sector, which already we have a problem with demand and supply. 
So with the 100,000 homes, what we would do or we would push for it to happen if the tenant was happy enough was that the debt would be wrote off and that house in, through a public bank would automatically become a social house. So we don't have to build 100,000 social houses straight away. Also, that would mean that we'd like to have a stop on the eviction bill so that all courts would automatically stop so that people are staying in their homes. We have to remember, we have to stop the crisis right now. We might come up with solutions to try and make it better in the future, but we need to keep people in their homes so that we don't have to provide any more services. Um, so with the mortgages, we found that like if the affordable homes, 50-50s, buy-to-lets, you're going to see a push of many people that were on a promise of home ownership into the private rental sector. And this all comes and coincides with the 2020 social housing policy when you see that privatisation of social housing is in the private sector. So you're going to have a push of more families from that into the private rental sector. We already have a crisis in the private sector with those that are cash-paying tenants. So you have cash-paying tenants that are being exploited, you may say, because some of them are living eight in a room, eight in a house. They're paying unreal rents because the rents are increases and there's no protections there. Rather be rent control linked to the index, what we feel is that rent control should be linked to income. We have to remember everybody's trying their best to get back into the big bad world from the recession and the opportunities aren't there tr for job opportunities which you can see many people being pushed onto jobs bridge, CE schemes and you might say that rent allowance is there to actually help these families. Rent allowance is not your friend. Rent allowance was introduced in the private market for those that had lost their jobs so that they were able to keep the roof over their head so that they would not end up homeless. But the glitch with that was you could not walk. You had to stay unemployed while you were accessing rent allowance. So this meant if you were to return to work when all wages had gone to a lower minimum wage, that you could not actually get enough money to pay for your rent, your food and your children. So the rent allowance has many catches. It had a cap as well. So the cap meant that you could only look for a certain property that was within that limit. That limit then obviously stayed, but the rents rise. So you were then forced into homelessness because you couldn't find another property that was the same price. So as we can see with the 2020 housing policy coming forward, the new housing assistance payment scheme is being introduced. The housing assistance payment scheme could be a good initiative for those on middle incomes so that they have a subsidy for their rent, not for those that are on low incomes or need access to social housing. Why is that? One, because you have no guarantee of length of tenure. Your contract is a two-year contract with the landlord, but it can develop up to 10 years. And the problem with that is, is after the two years, the landlord could decide he wants to move home. The landlord wants to sell the house. So once again, you are homeless. Once you go on the HAP, the Housing Assistance Payment Scheme, you are taken off the Dublin or the council housing list, and you are put onto a transfer list. So you are no longer seen as having a housing need. If you become homeless from the HAP house, Dublin City Council or any council does not have to provide you with another means because you're on a transfer list and not on an actual social housing need list. The transfer list is also another funny thing that you're not going to see working because apparently there's only 150,000 social housing stock left in Ireland. And now they are pushing for many people to buy with massive discounts from the social housing stock that we already have. So if they buy, that could reduce the 150,000 stock to about 50,000. And then you'll see those on the transfer list, the numbers will grow on the transfer list, but they don't need to supply them a social house and they'll be pushed back out into the private market. So what we can see is a growth, a growth in the homeless industry. And as you talk about the homeless industry, this is where it's getting very messy. We need to change the private rental sector. If you have a problem, so what we see is standards and conditions. So your standards and conditions, many people are living in awful standards and conditions. They don't know how to complain. They don't know their rights. They don't know how to take things forward or have a dispute with their landlords. So what you have now is the Residential Tenancy Board. It used to be the Private Residential Tenancy Board, but now because it's open up for voluntary housing agents, you can now take a dispute against them, who are also suppliers of social housing. So they're moving away from the social housing model and also into the private sector. As you can see from this, this will push an awful lot more into the dispute sector. And only the RTB there who get paid by landlords to help them evict and to get advice and stuff like that. There's nobody there to help tenants. 
There's no advocacy. The only advocacy advice group is Threshold, and they actually only give information and advice, and only on rare circumstances would they take a case to the RTB on your behalf. Otherwise, all tenants have to do it themselves. And they can be very fearful going into a room with a landlord and not actually knowing exactly what your rights are or the legislation. So if we have many people coming in through the social housing that are in a need, uneducated, fearful of those in power, we're going to find very less cases within the RTV. So what we feel is that the services need to be improved right across the board. We need a tenants union. That really needs to push forward because if they're going to privatise the whole social housing stock, the only way that tenants and people can fight back is through a union. We need to get organised, we need to get collective. The communities are going to change with private renting as well. What you can see in communities is, at the moment, in the social housing estate, everybody knows each other, friends know each other, they all go to school with each other. But in the private rental sector, you could be moving from one house to the next house, year to year, your children never settling, never making roots, and your family values changing. We have to look at what kind of communities we need to build. And that's a design that the architects really need to look into. How do we build a community? How do we build the services that a community actually wants? Get into the communities, talk to the people that are affected. Actually see what they need as a home. Instead of actually sitting there and being provided with options that aren't really realistic for you, for the values that an Irish person or anybody that moves to Ireland that wants to live the Irish life, it's going to be taken away from us. So this is where we really have to look at how we can all build together. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thanks very much to, um, for those very uh, vivid and, uh, I think, instructive um, contributions. Our next contributor is Orla Hegarty from the School of Architecture, Planning and Environmental Policy. Orla directs the professional diploma course here um, and has been very active, I think, in recent years in making a bridge, I guess, between academia uh, and practice and working on many aspects of professional practice uh, and has become, I suppose, known for her activities in this realm. Um, so uh, Orla's got some slides, I think, for the first time today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll, tr I'll try and be brief. I didn't get the memo about five points, so I have eight. So to begin with, um, what are we going to do now? Well, we are in a crisis, um, but more importantly, we have, we have very limited resources. Money is going to have to be found, and we need to ask how that's going to be spent, because we're going to bor borrow billions to put into the construction industry and that will all have to be repaid. So how do we ensure that these decisions are well considered and that they're evidence-based? Who's going to look after the process and manage the delivery and look after the risk? How are we going to change our regulatory and procurement systems because they're not fit for purpose? And how are we going to get the right balance between quality and cost with the money available? Because the two big risks are that the money might run out before we finish the task or that we will build more priory halls. So I would see this crisis as an opportunity as well, an opportunity to reform a lot of these systems and to look very closely at where the dysfunction is and how we build systems that are more durable and more resi resilient and more sustainable. So firstly, to look at the construction industry. No other sector was so devastated by the storm, and that's from the government's own report, Construction 2020. If we look at task, they say that in, at the time of the height of... The, the, the boom, there were 370,000 people employed directly and indirectly in the construction industry. And we now have fewer than half that number employed, many of them underemployed and many of them de-skilled. Add to that the fact that we haven't been building, so there's been a phenomenal drop in apprenticeships. People are not being trained up. We have an erosion of skills in the design and construction sectors because people haven't been working at that level. We have new standards, we have a lot of innovation, we have a lot of change in regulation. So there are really significant concerns now about a skills shortage in both the design and, and the construction end of the sector. In fact, it, it might even be the biggest threat to delivering this programme on time, the fact that we don't have the people to do it. So I would make the case that we need to put in some adequate supports and controls on that system so that the, the limited <coughs> resources we have can be used strategically and that the delivery programme is not put at risk. 
because the impact of a skills shortage is that prices go up and quality comes down. We also need to recognise the nature of the construction industry. It's very fractured. 95% of the construction industry is made up of individuals, tradespeople and micro-enterprises. So that's, that's, that's uh, companies of less than 10 people is 95% of the entire construction sector. Many developers are not builders. We need to make a distinction between what is a builder and a developer. So we have land speculators who are speaking as builders and developers who actually have no experience in the construction industry and everything will be subcontracted to these, uh, these people in the market. Subcontractors then will be working on very tight deadlines, complex contract arrangements, working very challenging and demanding conditions uh, without any control of the process, all managed from the top. So the procurement system has been mentioned. We have to acknowledge that reality. That's what we have out there to do the work. So we need to manage our procurement systems to fit the reality and not the other way around because going to market with expectations that can't be met will just reduce competition and drive up prices. Bundling large contracts together to, to, to build uh, vast quantities of units is much more likely to result in a lot of middlemen taking high margins with the same subcontractors working at lower rates and, and the impact that uh, that has on quality. So, ironically, economies of scale are not what you might think in the construction sector. And it may be counterintuitive to think of it that way, but, but myriad small solutions might be much better value for money and much more easy to control. Uh, our procurement systems are all based at, currently in the public sector on cost certainty. That is not the same as value for money. Uh, so we need to change that focus, I think, from a sort of risk-averse cost certainty model and away to a system where we support people actively who are delivering procurement and that they have a focus of value for money and robust quality control rather than a fear of, of accountability when there's cost overruns. We need to manage the risk differently. Thirdly, uh, life cycle costing. It's government policy that whole life costing should be accompanied by an analytical examination of sustainability performance, taking into account the wider economic, social and environmental context. So capital investment in these houses is a fraction of what it will cost over the life of these buildings to run them. And design is a tiny fraction of the, ca of the ca initial capital cost. So what we're talking about is a fraction of 1% being spent on the people who can think through how this money will be spent, how these buildings will be designed and used. We need to think differently about what design is. Design is just informed, intelligent, research-led decision-making. It's not an abstract con concept about the aesthetics of a building. So we need to think carefully about spending very small amounts of money relative to the cost of the building over its lifetime on, on good design at the right time. Uh, so we need, to, we need to think carefully about how that is done. And we need to make the best use of the resources we had. As, as Derek has said, it's very difficult to tap into the talent that's there because the systems keep them out. Climate change. Um, the greenest power is the power you don't have to produce. The residential sector accounts for uh, more than a quarter of all primary en energy demand in Ireland. So our houses are using more than a quarter of all of the energy demand. Government climate change policy recognises that energy, energy saving in homes can have a very significant benefit beyond the housing sector into other sectors. So though improving our housing stock could have benefits for agriculture and transport and other industries uh, by the savings that can be made in both the new stock that's to be built and in upgrading the existing stock. And if we look a little bit down the road into the future, technologies are becoming much more affordable and they're out there. Within a relatively short space of time, our houses have the potential to be energy generators and batteries feeding back and supporting the grid in off-peak time. So we could see our housing programme now as a resource that could power the economy in very different ways and could be strategically, this investment could be used quite differently if we build correctly. The average home spends about three and a half thousand euro a year to heat and power, uh, to power a three bedroom semi-house. Uh, that's a lot of money to put back into people's pockets and back into the economy at very little cost if we uh, roll out a retrofit programme and build the new houses properly. So there are enormous potential benefits to investing properly in, in this housing programme and thinking carefully about the money. Uh, number five, existing buildings. 
the most av immediately available solution to the housing crisis we have now is our existing buildings. And that is in our urban centres, in our suburban areas, in our rural towns and villages. There are a phenomenal number of empty and underutilised buildings. Many of these could have an apartment put into space for less than the site cost of putting a new unit <coughs> in the outer Dublin suburbs. So for 30 or 50,000, you could put an apartment back into use in an area where it has a community, a bus stop, shops, offices, a water supply, drainage connections. All of those things are already there. As an example of the regulatory barriers we have and the, the bureaucracy that is just not working, to put a single shop unit uh, to take a unit above one of those shops and to put it back into use as an apartment at the moment will require you to go through three completely separate regulatory processes. It will require the owner to make four statutory appointments. They will have to go to three different bodies to deal with all of that and they all work on different timescales and with different authorities. That is, that is the barrier that's there. So even if we, we, we make tax breaks or, or come up with other mechanisms to reuse existing buildings, that barrier can't be overcome because you can get through two of those hurdles and you can fail at the third. In terms of financing this, 75% of our housing stock has to be upgraded in the next uh, 30 years to meet EU requirements under the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. So by 2050, we have to upgrade 75% of our housing stock to an A2 standard, which is higher than we're building our new build to at the moment. That also means that if it has to be done, there's funding available and there's other ways of funding it. If we're doing retrofit programmes and you're bringing existi existing buildings into use, there are other mechanisms to go about funding this that we should be looking at. But more importantly, investing buildings is also unquestionably the key to unlocking our near-term decarbonisation challenge. And the broader benefits include superior asset values, if you build them properly they're worth more, increased productivity and competitiveness, fuel poverty alleviation, people will be living in better circumstances, greater energy security, we're not so uh, dependent on importing energy from abroad or generating it here, and a reduction in government health expenditure. So the, the, the benefits can be enormous if we do this right. It may in fact be the case that doing nothing with our existing buildings is the most expensive option. Uh, number six, construction failures. We have a very poor history of uh, construction in housing in certain sectors in this country. We have had a very number of high profile failures, including Priory Hall, Longboat Quay, Pirates, Pyrites most recently, bad blocks in Donegal, fires in various estates. So construction failure is not new, and it's not unique to Ireland, it happens in other countries, but the housing sectors are particularly vulnerable to construction failures. And that is because there is a pre predominance of hands-off procurement systems, so hands-off being speculative development, turnkey operations, PPPs, uh, and these type of procurement options are very vulnerable to poor quality. So we need to really think very carefully about the quality control systems we have in that. And more importantly, we need to think about what remedies we have for defects, because we don't have any at the moment. We still have a hands-off system of building control. It's still in the hands of the developers. And as I said, many of the developers are not, not builders, but they control the process. So although we have an inspection re regime and a certification regime, that is not in the hands of the local authority. It is, it is, it is privatised. Um, Self-certification, as we've seen, doesn't work in most other sectors, and I don't think it'll work in the housing market either. We need something much stronger. We also don't have any mechanisms of consumer redress that are adequate. Uh, when people find they have a problem, they are left with nowhere to go, or nowhere certain to go. And we've seen how that can become a political problem, and it ends up being funded from the public purse. So we need, we need that reform, and the Law Reform Commission first asked for that in 1977. We still haven't resolved it. And it's nothing new. There was, a Dublin, uh, there was an estate built by the local authority in Finglas in, the in 1972 where there were defects with construction. And subsequently there was a report um, that found that the inherent cheapness that was government policy to, by default at the time uh, was really the history of why there had been some failures in, in that development. So we need to think very carefully about what is cheapness, what is value for money, what is the best price. There's a big difference uh, between doing something cheaply and getting good value for money. And that comes back to the questions of procurement strategies, of ensuring people are trained when they're running the procurement strategies, and ensuring that in people who are informed 
are dealing with these complex decisions and complex issues. And design training, I would, I would say, is, is a critical, uh, critical thinking skill. Um, and it's important that those be brought to bear to do risk assessments on all of this delivery. Those skills can be used in many different ways, not just in what you might think of as design. Um, Research-led policy. Um, we have an opportunity here to rebuild a much leaner, more sustainable, well-regulated and research-led construction sector. We don't have that at the moment. We have a gov government policy on architecture that doesn't mention the word builders, and we have a government policy on construction that doesn't mention the word architects. Um, so we need, some, we need some much better joined up, up thinking. And, and there is an opportunity here because the systems are broken and the systems are dysfunctional. The banking inquiry found recently um, that the CIF relied heavily on the research of others which was all taken at face value. So we don't have a culture of using established research, of interrogating that research. And there are, as you will see at the moment, there's a lot of research being misused to push policy objectives. Uh, that you that is not being questioned and that is often uh, working in the interests of vested interests rather than in the interests of the housing policy. So we need to take a much harder line on accepting research and using research to further uh, to further some of these developments. And I know uh, uh, Derek mentioned the apartment standards. Uh, I don't think the case has been made actually that that the apartment standards by changing them will make development any cheaper because of the number of knock-on effects to financing <coughs> larger phases. Uh, to, to other implications that weren't considered in all of that. And I, I worry that we decisions are often being made on a knee-jerk rather than actually being interrogated properly. So I, I see that as an opportunity. We have a 12 billion construction sector in this country that may double in the next number of years, and we don't have a structured research programme that gives us evidence that we can use effectively to develop it. Uh, my final point is just in relation to building safety. Um, we're all conscious this week that 50 people died in a nightclub in Orlando. And we're in a different media world than we were 35 years ago, but we all are aware of what the impact of something like that and an event like that has. We might remember that 49 young people died in a nightclub in our own city in 1981. And we might remember, some of us, what the impact of that was at the time. The circumstances of some of that is, is still unclear. I, I don't know that we'll ever get to a resolution of it. But regulatory failure was a very significant contributory factor as to why those people couldn't get out of that building at the time. So these things are not, these things are not abstract. The, the standards we have and the enforcement of those standards and the consistent enforcement is not an abstract idea. The Stardust report found a uh, many number of regulatory failures uh, that went back to the ownership the lack of resources in the local authority, the poor standards we had at the time. We need to think very carefully about that. We still don't have a system that is robust enough to make our new housing safe. And in fact, many people would say there are aspects that make it dangerous. We really need to think about how that works and we need to change what we have. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to see the housing discussion opened up. I would like to see more discussion of what the implications are for the construction industry. And more importantly, I would like to see a really serious investigation of how we are going to deliver this housing, what systems we have in place, whether they're adequate and robust, and whether they're up to the challenge before we start to put money into the construction sector. Thank you. Thanks, Orla, uh, for eight points, very well made. Um, our final speaker in the panel is uh, Lorcan Sir, known to many of you, I'm sure, a lecturer in DIT, a housing policy analyst, and a frequent commentator and contributor uh, to debates on housing. Uh, and it seems <coughs> appropriate, given his um, ubiquity, I suppose, in discussions about housing, that he would be with us today and, and that he would have the, the last word before we go to Shelley. So, Lorcan. Thank you. About all this, uh, the housing issue, uh, and housing plans and housing policies and strategy, really we haven't had a policy since June 2011 when Willie Penrose for a very brief time was Minister for Housing. Uh, and we've, haven't, we've had plans and strategies, but we haven't had a policy since in the last five years exactly, actually. Uh, and that policy itself was uh, a four-page document. One of the pages was a cover, and it was three pages of a bit of mea culpa, and a couple of platitudes. And the only thing of value in it really was the concept of equity across tenures. 
I don't know where equity across tenures uh, sits in the department's thinking at the moment, but I'm sure uh, we'll quiz them at some stage. Um, the other thing I think that we have to, I'm kind of cutting across everybody's talks and picking up bits and pieces from them uh, and adding to my notes as I was listening to everybody. I think one of the, rea one of the things we have to do uh, is accept some hard facts and some realities uh, about life. And we have to ask ourselves um, some, kind of, some, imp Im some important questions um, about things like whose responsibility is it to actually house people? Uh, if there are homeless people, is it my responsibility as a taxpayer to house these people? Is it the state's responsibility? Um, and we don't ask those questions. And increasingly the state has turned to everybody but itself to, to help people house themselves. But we need to ask that question about whose responsibilities or to what degree is it our responsibility to help people. Personally, I believe it's very much my responsibility as a citizen and as a taxpayer to help uh, people get housed and house themselves. But there has been an ideological preference for anybody but the state to help people house, house themselves. And I think we need to ask ourselves that question and have a little bit of a, a reflection about the level or the degree of responsibility that we're taking on ourselves to, or you know, that we should afford ourselves to help people house themselves. I think we, we absolutely should. Um, but there's a Boston Berlin thing that's been going on for the last few years and we've very much gone towards the Boston end of things where everybody for themselves. And then we end up in a huge mess like we can see at the moment. The other question that we need to ask ourselves is, like, is how much control does the state actually have over housing? And the answer is a lot less than you think. Um, we think that the state uh, through the civil service and departments and all that kind of stuff can make things happen. Well, actually, they're operating under an umbrella of a whole load of things going on in the world around them. That means that the level of control that we can have over housing now and in the future is much reduced. So if you think about things like um, uh, global economic crises, for example, has a massive effect on the housing market in Ireland. Nothing to do with the government here, really. Changing employment patterns and trends, changing employment locations. And I'll give you an example. I go in and out of places like RTE and News Talk, right? Dennis O'Brien's organisation, a brilliant example of this, right? And you go up to the third floor of News Talk, and it's all wonderful. There's Ivan, and there's Pat Kenny, and lovely. And there's like 45 youngsters with degrees and master's degrees in media and communication. And they've got two screens each and big headphones on, right? And they're cool because they're working in media. And they're all on three month contracts. Those people, and they're not just 25, they're up to 45. Those poor people will never get a mortgage in their lives because they go into Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, AIB, whatever, and they say, you're, you're a very wonderful person and you're getting well paid while you're working in there on the third floor in Marconi House, um, but you're only in three month contracts. So a lot of housing issues aren't necessarily to do with money, they're to do with employment and employment, change employment patterns and trends. And we see this with zero hour contracts in the UK, uh, and coming in here, and all, all, all that kind of changing work conditions. Academia, like for years, we couldn't employ anybody full time. It was all on contract. So you could have a PhD and be a really clever person and go into the bank and say, well, you're earning X amount of money because it's a state job, but you're only there for three years. So why would we give you a mortgage? So there's a whole generation of people who will be renting for a long, long time. And these are the kind of facts that we need to, to look at. Um, you know, the last census said 18.5% of people are, are households are renting. That's going, to be incre that's going to increase, I think, at this census, and it will continue to in increase in line with European and global patterns everywhere. We're not odd here. We're just catching up because we've always been late to the party. So we need to accept these facts that the rental sector is going to be in incredibly important. Um, I think we need to accept the fact that there's going to be housing support uh, for a lot of people and that, that we need to do that. So we have to look at some, some kind of accept these realities. Um, there's also a reality about how bad we are at managing our housing. Do you know how many houses become obsolete every week in Ireland? Can you consider when I was listening to Peter at the start saying about eight, fa eight families or eight people a day become homeless? 190 houses per week in Ireland become obsolete. Per week. That's nearly one third or one quarter, depending on what figure you use, of our total housing need every year. We are really poor at managing what we have. And we're afraid to grasp the nettle at things like property tax, a serious property tax. If you had to pay two or three grand a year for every house that you had and you weren't bothered putting a tenant in it or using it, or following, you'd pretty soon find a use for that house. So we, we kind of need to look at, uh, at those kind of things. Um, so there's a question of you know, facing up to the facts about life uh, and housing in Ireland, and the fact that the rental sector is going to be really important, the fact that we're bad at managing things, uh, and the fact that you know, we need to address some of the, 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 the issues around 
taxation and around a better use of the resources that we already have. Building is one part of the solution. Managing what we have is the other half of it. And we, could, we need to be able to do both a little bit better. Um, so that's kind of the, some of the questions about control, about how much state control does the state have. Very little. The, the causes of demand, for example, I'll give you just, just to give you an idea of, of how, the, the, how the state, how come this won't go on? The state can't control things. Where's the lady who controls these things? Um, how the, here we go. How the state doesn't have control. The, the causes of, of housing demand aren't what you think. Okay? The last cause of housing demand is the fact that we have no houses okay, or that we're not building. The first cause of housing demand is what's called the headship rate. And that's about people staying single, single for longer. One third of all our, our households are going to be single person. We're going to have a huge drop off in the marriage rate or the rate of people cohabiting. When you don't get two people getting together, they have two separate houses, not one. Okay, that is the biggest cause of housing demand. The government can do nothing about that. You can't force people to marry. Um, family breakup is a huge issue. I spent last year working in Spain. Uh, when they introduced their divorce laws, they had a huge housing problem because you had the couple that were living together and now, oh, we can get, hola, we can get divorced. Away they go like that and they get divorced. The next thing, they need two accommodation, two units instead of one. The state can do nothing about that. And then you have empty nesters and, and people like that. Obsolescence at a... At, depending on what figure you look at, but in around eight to 10,000 houses a year. Okay, now the state could do something about that. Population growth, the state can't do anything about. But next year, we're going to see net immigration into Ireland, okay, by about 16,000 people. Most of them are going to come to Dublin, because this is where the work is. Um, the state can do very little about that unless we want to go Brexit and kind of put up borders and all that kind of crap. And the last one then is immediate demand. And the problem with immediate demand is great, and we're building, ex last year we built 12,666 houses. 47.6 of those were one-off houses in the countryside. So they don't come on the market. So essentially you have about 6,000 houses that we could offer to the populace, to, you know, do you want to buy this house? Okay, so they're the causes of demand, and the state can do, you know, has control over only about a third of that. The big cause of demand, people staying single for longer, single forever, Divorce, state can do nothing about that. And that's, they're all huge drivers of housing demand. The Oireachtas report on housing homelessness came out yesterday. And I had a chance to have a look at it, 161 pages. Uh, and I, the words, some journalists around me yesterday say, what do you think? And I couldn't come up with a word. Uh, and she had her thesaurus in front of her. And she said, how about underwhelmed? And I said, that is a wonderful word. I am underwhelmed by it. Um, and I just, to correct something that Peter said, not to, 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 to mark your card more than correct you, um, it said that they're going to tell local authorities to deliver 50,000 houses uh, over the next four years, right? The devil is in the detail here, the word deliver. If you read the small print uh, about that clause, it says to acquire, to refurbish or build. I guarantee you they will be acquiring housing, houses left, right and centre to fulfil that 50,000. That is not adding to the stock of houses that we have. Unless you add to the stock of the houses that we have, it's meaningless. So the 50,000, it, is, it isn't a build. If it was a build, I would think, wonderful, that's excellent. I found the, the Oireachtas Report less than radical. There's no mention, as Orla said, of quality, of building quality, or of remedy or redress. And you can't have quality without an opportunity to remedy something that isn't built to a high quality. We're still late to the party with things like latent defects insurance. And so on. There was no mention of quality. Lots of mention about delivery, nothing about quality. We have a huge housing quality issue in Ireland. You know, the minimum is the maximum, always, which is why I was very disappointed to see the department reduce the, the size standards, because that's going to be the starting point for a lot of people who are developers or builders, or whatever they are. There's a failure to grasp the nettle about the reality of the importance of the private rented sector. So the rent certainty, link it to CPI, yeah, wonderful. The other part, the other flip side of that coin of rent certainty is the reasons whereby a landlord can ask you to leave your property. And the key one, and the killer one, and if you talk to a threshold about this, they will tell you that the, use, the landlord uses this excuse, or uses this reason, it's perfectly legal, I want it for myself or a family member. Okay, and they take the tenant out of the property on the premise that they're using for, who knows if they're ever going to use it for a family member. The onus is on the tenant who is now homeless to go and prove that. I'm sure they're gone. You know, they're off somewhere else. They're not sitting spying outside the house to see, is that the landlord's nephew coming and going? They didn't, they failed to grasp the net with that one. So it's pointless to talk about four-year leases and ten-year leases if the landlord always retains that right to evict you for a family member. And you will not, not, never have a mature private rented sector unless you tackle the issue of security of tenure. And there are loads of ways to do it. My proposal at the moment is that any landlord who has more than three properties 
it becomes a business, we give you 100% mortgage interest relief, and we'll give you the right to write off your expenses against your rental income, uh, but you lose the right to evict a tenant for, when the property's for sale or for a family member. And now you're making a decision, if I have three properties, it's a bit of a pension pot, if I have more than three properties, I'm now business, and business rules apply. But the government, or the Oireachtas Committee, it was really weak on that. I thought that was terrible. So, and the reality is we're going to need the private rental sector for about a third of all the population. Right now, 3% of the population, who are the landlords of Ireland, they're only 3%, uh, have the right, the legal right, to evict more than 20% of all households. And there's nothing we can do about it. And that, I thought that was uh, a, missed, a total missed opportunity. I'm probably going way over 10 minutes here, am I? Okay. So we need to acknowledge the changing nature of, of the housing system. And it is changing. It's nothing that we haven't seen the world over. If you go to Europe, you'll see that the system has changed, but probably 50 years ago, and we're catching up now, because, mostly because of our obsession with home ownership. And it's, not, it's, it's a very understandable obsession when you think about the way our pension scheme is structured around having an asset, the way our fair deal scheme for your health is structured around having an asset. It's understandable that everybody wants to own their own home. You don't want to be 66 in Ireland and renting, to be perfectly frank. And you definitely don't want to have a health problem 66 and renting in Ireland. So we need to kind of look at the private rental sector uh, and see how we can move it on. So the reality is the state needs to kind of grasp the changing nature of the housing system for people, and people themselves must accept the fact that well, you know, about one third of people are never going to own their own property. So the state needs to help this out, help, help make that happen in a reasonable way where you might own, but you will always be able to live there. I think builders need to accept, or the those in the development industry need to accept the new reality. There's new financial uh, reality out there about profit margins, for example. There's new building techniques that they're not even looking at. We're still building houses, and Derek will probably correct me here, but we're still building houses, as far as I can see, the way we did in the 60s and 70s. Apartment design hasn't moved on in 15 years, as far as I can see. Um, so there's new realities for builders. The, 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 I have this out Tom Parlin regularly. Uh, the construction industry is busy looking for everybody else to solve its problems, and there's very little self-reflection going on. And I think the building industry would do well to have a look at itself and see how it can contribute to solving the housing process. For the state, um, security of tenure is not an option. Uh, for the state. It, it has to happen. We have to have security of tenure, and the state needs to step up uh, to the plate there. It's good uh, that research is coming to the fore. The department, you just close your ears here, Sarah, for the next 15 seconds. The, the department's research, in inverted commas, on, the, on reducing the apartment size standards was embarrassing. I would have failed a first year undergraduate student if they'd come up with something like that, to be perfectly frank. Go and look at it online, have a look at the research that un underpins it, the research, uh, and it was awful absolutely awful and this is now the new reality and it was underpinned by a ministerial uh, by, by like the department broke its own rules on on so many aspects no regulatory impact assessment no public consultation spoke to the architect spoke to the cif spoke to property industry Ireland. did it speak to any threshold did it speak to peter did it speak to anybody who represents tenants or anybody no absolutely not uh, and then it was underpinned by ministerial guidelines that are now mandatory so we have the oxymoron now of mandatory guidelines uh, to enforce them, which I thought was pretty poor. The, the other thing is housing support is going to be a reality, and I'm just going to finish on this. Actions have consequences, right? So it's all very well for me to talk about, you know, delivering housing and all that. There will be costs for all of us here, you know, and the reality is that we're probably going to have to accept that we're not going to be as wealthy as we were before, uh, and there might be a percent or two uh, uh, in income tax extra that we have to pay, but, uh, you know, these things don't come free. PPPs are not the answer. That's like buying houses on your credit card. We're very bad at procurement here. Less than 25% of all people in the state, in Ireland, in, in the state uh, public sector in, in Ireland, who are involved in procurement have any form of training in it, not even a weekend course. And yet we're out, you know, contracts for hundreds of millions with no training in this. So we're going to get fleeced. Uh, so PPPs are not the answer. There, there will have to be capital costs, uh, which are much cheaper than, than um, putting on PPPs. But the reality is that us, as taxpayers, we're probably going to have to bear the brunt of some of that out of our pockets. I'm happy to do that, but the question is, you know, are we as a society happy to do that? OK, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Larkin, for that whistle-stop tour through uh, lots of suppose, interesting issues and questions. I'm now going to hand over to Shelley McNamara, who has the unenviable task, I think, of trying to draw together a lot of what we've heard. Um, Shelley is the director of Grafton Architects, internationally renowned practice uh, alumni uh, of the year last year and adjunct professor here at the school. Um, I'm delighted to have her here this morning to offer her thoughts on what we've heard uh, and what we can do now. Shelley. 
Uh, when Hugh and Orle asked me to make some comments, I thought it would be a much simpler uh, task. But having heard the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven speakers this morning, I realized I can't possibly make a comprehensive response except to say that it was a fantastic session. And in a sense, I think what has made it really important is the diversity of, uh, of, of, of points of view and um, the diversity of the ideas. And I find the contradictions, in a way, as interesting as the points of uh, agreement. And maybe just in terms of the notes that uh, I made as people were speaking, um, uh, Peter McFerry said that no one department can solve the problem. And I think the same is true as practicing architects. No one discipline can solve this problem. And um, he spoke about the fact that DCC don't want to build social housing, don't want to get involved in it again, which is an extraordinary diagnosis of our situation, given that we've come from a legacy of public um, resort, public um, housing having been built by the state, and now it's completely privatized. And then, in, in, and the, the, the other thing I thought was interesting was touching on not wanting to renovate uh, existing buildings, which came up again and again in other uh, presentations. And then in terms of Sarah, it's really interesting because then directly you were saying that we will be relying on the private sector. So it's the exact opposite to perhaps what did happen or what maybe could or should happen. Uh, it was very interesting because you were speaking about a greater mix uh, of uh, typologies and uh, about the importance of uh, good design. And one of the things I was thinking about was that it, there's something about the way that the word design is used when we speak about architecture. And somehow it's perceived that design is something that comes after everything else is decided, that it's not understood that... Uh, architects have the capacity to get involved way before design. And the, perhaps that is the secret of what Alan and Ashley were speaking about, which is that we're building communities, we're not just building houses, or we're not just building apartments. And Derek typically gave a very precise, incisive diagnosis of the, the, the situation and the blockage that we spoke about earlier and referred again to the, the housing um, stock built historically, in, built in, in the past, and, not, and to keep the faith. And, and I suppose the thing that was really important, which I thought related to, um, to uh, Orla's um, presentation, was a thing about being honest about the time scale and also about the radical rethinking of procurement and perhaps simplifying what is a huge problem into something more manageable, that it could be divided into a certain number of projects which are uh, of a manageable scale. And I found that really, um, really uh, interesting about Orla's presentation about economies of scale. And it's, I suppose what was also really refreshing about the presentations this morning is that they weren't opinions, they were statistically based. And so it's not just someone's opinion, it's, it's a kind of reality. And I found that that kind of... Um, uh, let's say, um, analysis of, of the implications of the plans uh, really revealing and, uh, in, in terms of the fact that a myriad of small-scale solutions could be more viable, could be the most economic uh, way to go. And I think a lot of people in this room would feel that the more organic uh, approach to, uh, to the making of housing is possibly much more manageable uh, and much more will lead to, to, uh, to making of more uh, successful communities. When we talk about building communities, that's probably the, the most difficult task for an architect or for, for the, the, the people involved in, in housing. Um, Florian Bagel, an architect whom we all admire, says that the term housing should be banned because it suggests that it's to do with the uh, it's not, like in other languages, it's habitat, in, it's vonum, which means habitat, which is a place to live. And um, 
Adrian Forty, a uh, writer on architecture, talks about the history of comfort and that comfort historically wasn't physical but was social, that you would feel at home in your uh, community. So perhaps in terms of our, um, our standards and our regulations, that the, the phenomenon of the community should be also uh, thought about uh, and not just the, 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 the standards, the physical standards, of, um, which are hugely important, of course. I heard um, terms which I'd never heard before. Um, somebody used the term, uh, uh, was, it the, was it the industry of, of, of uh, home, the growth in the homeless industry? And uh, one of the things that I found really interesting about Alan and Ashling's presentations was that in some way they supported uh, what, um, what uh, Peter McFerry was saying and also what uh, Larkin was saying at the end is whose responsibility is it? Are we, are we actually, I mean, what came across to me this morning was the words like um, the, the tenancies having to, a tenancy union to fight the private sector. So the idea that the housing is being built by a sector that one has to fight against as opposed to being supported by is somehow um, a question we should uh, think about. Um, and I, maybe, maybe a lot of what has been talked about this morning comes back to that uh, question of, of communities, that we're building communities and not just housing, and whose responsibility is it, and are we in a situation where everything is being over-privatised and the implications of this are just staring us in the face? Thank you. Thank you very much, Shelley. Um, I'm conscious that our, of course, our schedule has slipped a little bit, um, but I wouldn't have wished any of our present presenters <coughs> speak for uh, less time than they did. Um, at this stage, I think we still have about 10 or 15 minutes to open up the discussion, um, either to members of the audience or those who've been listening, or indeed to our panelists to respond maybe to what some of of others on the panel have said. Uh, I, uh, no need, I see three hands up, four hands up. So I'm going to go to Doug. You, okay. Um, I, one, one word that I hadn't heard this morning, but uh, maybe I'd just like to ask the panel's um, opinion on it, is that of infrastructure or homes as infrastructure? Um, that might there be, uh, particularly thinking about the role of engineers or the role of, of planners, and we in this country that we seem to be very effective at building roads, uh, very effective at building very big, uh, you know, impressive roads at, at kind of high levels of European standards. Is there a, is there a place for thinking about the, uh, particularly the scale of the task in terms of um, infrastructure? So maybe I might get a response from people. Very, very briefly. Um, it's interesting when you look at housing, that everything that surrounds the house, the roads, the sewers, the airport you flew into to get on the road to get to your house, is infrastructure. But the house isn't. And the house is typically... So the infrastructure is supplied by the state, and the house is left to the market. That's a really risky approach to take as a state, mm. which goes back to the point about, you know, if you, if, you, if you become a price maker, not a price taker, if you deliver the housing as a state, you have control of all the infrastructure. I would totally support the idea of housing as the infrastructure. Delivering housing, the NTMA, the National Treasury Management Agency, are going to deliver 1,500 social houses by PPP uh, using a contract uh, system. They're really good at delivering roads. Like there's a, there's a, a you know, a five mil tolerance on a, on a road. You know, it's really detailed. All the engineers in the audience will notice. It's really detailed and it's really well done. Delivering housing is not delivering roads. So I would be worried that because there's a whole air issues around communities and that which you don't have to worry about your community when you're building the M6 to Galway. Um, so I'd be, I would be concerned that the same the principles that apply to delivering a road uh, as infrastructure would be applied to housing. I think they're two different things. But great, uh, it's absolutely, I think, a great point, that. Thank you. Hi, I just want to say who I am, because so I want to make sure that my comment is from uh, the organisation. I'm Carol Pollard, I'm President of the Institute of Architects, so I'm just speaking, uh, speaking from that point of view. 
Um, I, since I became president, I have gone around the country meeting very, very, very many architects. So um, I just want to say that procurement is the biggest issue facing our, all architects in Ireland at the moment. And I just want to endorse what Derek said about it taking 18 months to appoint a, a design team. Um, and I just, the biggest loss that our country has at the moment in terms of the architectural talent I, that it has, and it is a seriously good talent, is just that if you haven't done it, you can't get on, procure, on, on a procurement framework. And I think that is actually, that is just a crime. Um, I think that um, architects have the skills. Architects spend at least five years in college learning how to design, and they spend at least 75% of their time of those five years learning how to design. Every architect can design housing. Every architect can design small buildings of whether they be healthcare or libraries or community buildings or um, retail units or all architects can design these and the procurement system has to change to facilitate that. So I just want to uh, support Derek's idea of an architectural competition. Uh, the RAI are fully behind that. We would be absolutely delighted to work with uh, any of the government departments that want to take that on. If, the, if local authorities can identify sites, we will run and manage a design competition and we will roll right in behind it um, and uh, it will definitely generate a huge amount of public interest and engagement with the community and the people who need the housing most of all. Um, I just want to make a very small point about regulation. Uh, we are completely over-regulated in this country in every single thing that we do, um, and that uh, building is one of those things. It uh, currently takes, uh, each house requires 35 separate certificates um, in, for its construction process. 35 certificates for each house. You can just imagine how much that slows up any process, and really what does it deliver at the end of the day when if something goes wrong with your house, the only person who doesn't have insurance to help you put that right is the builder. All of the professions involved in construction have to carry professional indemnity insurance, and they are subject to the Civil Liability Act, which is also known as the 1% rule. So if they can be seen to even be 1% one, one responsible for any fault in a building, the, their PI insurance is the target for the person going after that. A builder has to have insurance for his employees, for public, if the public walking by get hit by something falling from his building site and various other types of insurance, but he doesn't have to have any insurance for what he builds. So that is why um, things like Priory Hall and all those other terrible things have the effect that they do on people and how the tenants and the owners who bought apartments in those developments are left in the terrible situation that they are left in. That needs to change. And the last thing I would like to say is I'd like to just finish um, uh, on a note which I think really comes down to the nub of what we're talking about here today and it's where we are as a country and what our philosophy is with regard to social housing and I think we need to listen to Alan and we need to Ash listen to Ashling and we need to listen to Peter and we need to take on what Lorcan <coughs> says and we need to acknowledge whose responsibility is it to provide housing and I would say we love referendums in this country we had one of the best referendum campaigns ever this time last year with a fantastic result and I would wonder what would happen if we had a referendum of the people to see who should be responsible for delivering public housing. I would like to see what the result of that referendum would be. Thank you. Um, it was stated here um, correctly, I think, that architects are good designers and can design many things, uh, not just the building itself, because designing is a skill. It's a skill of learning how to make decisions where you don't where you only have partial information and where you really only have very partial control. I must say that this institution, the School of Architecture, has not been good at that for the last 30 years. It has concentrated solely on the aesthetics of design, and that's partly why we are in this position today. But I would like to tell you that, that we are remedying that now. Those of us who are working in the design of systems that produce sustainable settlements, sustainable ways to live, are willing to look at economics Money, that boring thing that we never looked at as architects, very interesting. It's also a big lie and can be redesigned to produce for our needs. So just to cut to the chase, we've heard nothing about the problems here. Some of us have been working on solutions, not just in Ireland, through the world. Um, and these solutions have been tested in other places. The solution that we think is most important now, we've been meeting for a year, not just architects, but planners, um, housing associations, cooperatives, and so on, is the Community Land Trust. It's not a question of public and private. There is a third sector, and that's the commons. What we need to do to solve permanently 
our housing situation across all sectors is to take land out of the equation. And I disagree, Lorcan. There's no need for us working people to pay any more to do that. The value is in the land. All we do is take that back and we can deliver sustainable housing for everybody, for public sector housing, for social housing, for cooperatively built housing, which we're getting nothing done of in this country except one-offs in the countryside, which are anti-sustainable and destroy rural, rural communities. We can do that. Private sector housing for sale. So it's not just us boomers who can get to enjoy our own house and security in our old age. The next generation can, can also enjoy that. We don't have to take Berlin. We don't have to take Boston. We can look at Vermont, what Bernie Sanders did um, when he supported the Vermont Community Land Trust. And that community survived and thrived through the worst Boston boom. Not as bad as ours, but a bad Boston boom in, the, in America. The RAI has been supporting us on this, but it's not an official RAI proposal. And we're looking for support where we can get it. And it's extraordinary how difficult it is to get support, even from left-wing thinkers in many cases, because it is a new idea. It, is, it does cross left and right. It is, we're talking a new sector here, a commons. But we're, we're hoping now that the RII, and they'll be deciding on this on the 24th, will support uh, a study by, we have to find outside validators, because this is Ireland after all, of the financial model, which is a small amount of money. And the RAI hopefully will support us on that. And then with, if we can get a forum, which is, I can tell you, very difficult to get, we can explain how this idea can work. It's not just working for Ireland. They're looking at it in London, where they have a deep housing crisis as well, New York, Canada, and in Europe. This is a potent solution to permanently solve the housing crisis in Ireland. And I know we're not used to hearing about solutions and it's not, it's not even a popular thing or an appropriate thing to say, yes, there is a solution. We're all supposed to be overwhelmed with the problem. Everybody outlines the issues over and over and over again. And yet public procurement, straightforward procurement of housing is part of that solution. But community land trusts enable that part to happen as well as social housing, and they are good. They, uh, uh, they approved housing bodies uh, at, uh, much better at management of social housing. And new sectors can happen, and we can keep home ownership, just not land ownership. Land has to be owned by all of us. Thank you. Okay, I'm conscious of time. Okay, oh gosh, okay. All right, we'll just take, uh, maybe no, I have no. three hands up, so I have four. Okay, um, I'd just like to congratulate everybody on the panel here today. I think it's been an amazing morning. I think all eight, I don't know who choreographed it, but you all made excellent points, each one of them individual and quite distinct from each other, even though there was a common ground. And I just hope, I see it's being recorded, I hope that there might be a document come out of this morning which compiled all of the ideas that have been put forward and put it into a coherent form that could go to government and could go to the various sectors, because it's not just government, as, as, as Lorcan has said, and that we get something quite positive out of today's, um, today's session. I've just one question, and that was a question for Lorcan, um, which was, uh, I, I didn't quite understand your um, reference to the extent of obsolescence and how this obsolescence was coming about and what can be done about that obsolescence. Yeah, the obsolescence uh, arises for lots of reasons. People inherit properties that, that don't live in the state. Uh, so you could have somebody living in Canada and inherits a house in Offaly, I'm sure they never visit it and the house gets run down. You have people who have property who can't be bothered doing anything. It's a, it's a, it's a really interesting thing in a country with a housing crisis, but there are plenty of people who own properties uh, and they just can't be bothered doing anything with it because it's too much hassle to get it rented out, sure, I'll leave it be for another few years. There's, there's issues around when a change in regulation happens, that can make a building obs obs obsolete through no fault of its own, but through the change in regulation, you know, a higher standard is now required, therefore the building doesn't meet uh, the minimum standards. There are issues around that. And there's also issues about people, you know, having more property than they know and, and just letting it lie fallow. 
Uh, and if you travel around Ireland, my mum lives in the middle of Tipperary, and when I travel around Tipperary, it is shocking how many houses are empty, owned and empty and sitting there and becoming uninhabitable through neglect and through a lack of care. And the way to solve that is, is back to the idea of like managing our housing is half the problem, I think, and the other half is building. But if you did, even if you had to pay 2,000 or 5,000 or whatever it is, uh, a large tax on every property that you had to own until you prove beneficial occupation, suddenly we'd find uses for all these kind of things. There is a shocking amount. The, the 10,000 a year, just for people, uh, it's, it's a CSO number. I'm not making that up. It's a census statistics uh, number that they use to, as a measure of our rate of obsolescence for our entire housing stock. Um, can I'm just conscious of time, I'll take two, three more points and then I think we should, we should close. Can I just one, respond to one other yes. um, aspect of that? Um, uh, the vacant land tax, which is kind of a watered down version, I was on the uh, commission, the Lord Mayor's commission a couple of years ago in terms of uh, the introduction of a vacant land tax, um, and uh, which would apply to both public and private properties. Um, and uh, there's a kind of a slightly watered down version of that in the current, in, in current legislation. But you could imagine how uh, a version of that could be used to bring uh, houses back into operation. In other words, as Lorcan says, if, it was, if they're empty and remain empty, then you know, there, there's a tax which is paid on that, which is over and above any other property tax. And I think there might be a model in the vacant land tax um, that, that, that could be used in that fashion. I'd like to uh, add to the last speaker. I think everybody today made brilliant points and I do hope that they go somewhere. But one theme that ran through almost everybody's comments were the benefits of taking ownership of the social housing from a state perspective. And uh, for example, Peter started off talking about building social housing rather than relying on the private sector. Alan pointed out that you could build higher standard, more appropriate housing, more efficiently, compared to the kind that private sector might be aiming to cater to. And I just want to check if I misunderstood the government's position. Why does the government appear not to want to go this route? Why are you t referring to private? What's, why have you decided to move away from, if I've understood correctly, move away from taking this into your own hands <laughs> build affordable housing that you can control, because otherwise we're perennially linked to the private sector problem of price. So have I missed something? Yeah. Look, at it, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, uh, from my perspective, I think um, there's been a lot of talk about privatization of housing. Um, the social housing strategy it divides up two sectors, one kind of a capital expenditure on housing for the state and then a current expenditure. So the capital expenditure is about stock that's owned and managed by the state and the local authorities and that comes from a mixture of new build, um, bringing voids back into use, um, acquisitions, part fives um, and then the direct building as I think I said already. Um, that's 35,000 units over the lifetime of the social housing strategy, so that's up to 2020. There's no departure away from um, social housing or the state providing housing for people um, that need it. And uh, it is a very strong theme here that everything's being privatised. It's not. There is a, an element that is being run by the state. Um, there is, then the current expenditure is about supporting people who are in rental accommodation. So that's the affordable part of the jigsaw, if you like. Um, so the, the committee's, um, the Oireachtas committee's uh, proposals yesterday was to increase that kind of capital expenditure through a range of mechanisms, but will all ultimately be owned and managed by the local authority. So we haven't moved away from social housing, but there, are, there is another element to it, which is a current expenditure supporting people in private, um, private rental. And the, the whole private rental sector is being looked at. There are supports that are needed. There's, there's support for both sides of the equation in order for it to work. Um, and, and that's 
that is a, a major focus of the, the Housing Action Plan, um, along with regeneration and the use of vacant units. Um, a, a lot of the, the comments there today are, are, you know, have been heard and have been, are being incorporated. Um, so I suppose that's, that, I don't know if that answers your question or... <laughs> I'm just going to, I have two more. I have to close the event because I'm conscious that people have other commitments. So. Um, I have a three-part question to put forth to the panel. Um, the first thing is um, if the panel see um, professionals uh, of the built environment, so uh, architecture, educators, uh, professionals, um, uh, urban planners, uh, regulatory and governing boards, um, if they can see a practical way of working with the Irish Housing Network, um, listening to them and harnessing their knowledge um, and bringing them into the decision-making process. Um, the second uh, part is uh, to do with uh, the D DCC and how they're responding to the housing crisis um, and almost uh, like they're punishing and um, making an example of uh, housing activists. So for example, Ashling and Seamus, uh, were, they had reoccupied the Bolt Hostel last year, um, which had been left vacant for three or four years. Um, and it was one of four homeless hostels in the city. Um, and they, uh, they were slapped with an injunction of, on the works. Um, at the hostel and then brought to the high court and they faced a hefty fine. Um, and uh, why that's the case. And the third part is uh, to do with maybe if there's a way of um, expanding the vacant spaces initiative. Um, I don't know exactly how that works, but um, there's a big subculture of squatting in Dublin um, and uh, like everyone in the panel touched on, um, we need to mobilize um, the properties that are left vacant um, and address that. Is, is, is there an immediate response to that? Or do you want to As for the first part of our question, working with the Irish Housing Network, as you know, we're the collective, we're willing to work with anyone, we've t we've been to housing forums where there's a wide variety of people, and everyone can have their input. And I think it's a pity when there there is developments coming along that all these people ain't sat down with the local community, which would probably provide for much more sustainable communities instead of building them and leaving them there to find their own fee with lack of services and all. So for the first part of our question, I think it would be safe to say, now, as we're the collective, me and Ashley can't answer for the housing network because everything has to be voted on and everyone has to row in. But I couldn't see a problem if any group of interested individuals wanted to sit down with us and discuss their ideas on housing, that would be more than welcome. I'll we'll give it over to Ashley now to answer our question about the vote. We just got We are linked in with Minute uh, Geography section as well, so we would be open to working with different areas, especially across the universities. Um, second part, about DCC, I have an awful lot of problems with the way DCC actually manage and hold their policies in how they conduct their services. I feel that um, an awful lot of people on the housing list are being punished because there's different ways that they could alleviate the housing crisis and stop controlling um, those that are most at need. I feel that um, I can start with, like, kind of, you can't move outside Dublin city or you can't move county. So if you move county, you come off Dublin housing list and you start at the very bottom of another list, but you can't access um, supplements in another county unless you're six months on that county's list. So therefore you need six months cash to move outside of the city or to move outside of the country. 
Um, if you're homeless down the country, you cannot move into Dublin and access the homeless services in Dublin. And if you're homeless in Dublin, you can't move outside. So it feels like they're containing the crisis and they're containing and controlling as many people as possible that they can. So once again, it comes to management of people more so than management of properties. Um, as for what happened with the Bolt, it was this time last year, we decided we were having so many cases coming forward to us that couldn't access emergency accommodation, and this is still ongoing. We have families that are on self-accommodate, which means that you have to ring around hotels. You don't even get a list of a hotel that you have to ring. You have to ring around as many hotels as you possibly can on the hope that you might get a bed for the night. So you could be on the street with two children. Um, and no help, no supports, and if not, they expect you to go sofa surfing on friends, families, and it can get a bit draining because it will be continuous, it can be up to six weeks before you actually access a hotel room. Um, and then you have the hostel situation where they're usually allocated by Dublin City Council. You have to prove why you're homeless, how you became homeless, um, and if they find that you left your home, they won't give you or allocate emergency accommodation either. And you could leave your home for many different reasons. There could have been abuse, there could have been drug use, there could have been the landlord eviction, an illegal eviction, um, and all among them. So with DCC, they, they have got their problems, but with, that's one of the reasons why we decided that we'd open the Bolt Hostel, so that we could actually gap stop the problems of anyone not being able to access emergency accommodation and use it kind of as a rolling over um, access point for anybody that was vulnerable and not able to access emergency accommodation, particularly families at the time. We held the building, perfectly great building. We had got homeless people staying in it and we moved them out, two or three of them actually got into the private rented sector, so they were happy enough with that. Unfortunately, we did get taken to court um, because we were told that Nova's initiatives were going to take over the building and actually supply it as a social housing apartment. To this day, it's still empty. Nothing has happened to that building. Um, we had offered to run the building, link in with the services, have a fire proofed, everything. We offered that to DCC and unfortunately they wouldn't take that. They just wanted us out of that building. So once again, all buildings that could be used should be used. And it will also help alleviate the services problem within the homeless sector. One last um, point to make. Jim Roach from the School of Architecture DIT. Hugh, I've loads to say. I can't come. <laughs> um, very interesting, and thanks to everyone for uh, all the information. Uh, I think ultimately it's not a design problem, except in the largest understanding of design. I, I don't think it's about the design of the housing units themselves. I think there's lots of wonderful exemplars out there that we can draw on, uh, unless some new wonderful material is going to be invented where. We, we can possibly uh, digitally print new housing schemes to speed up the process. Or I really like Derek's thing on the fire regs. I think that does have to be addressed. So ultimately, it's not a design problem, though. It's a political and social problem. And uh, I think we need political and social solutions. And one of them has to be about this issue of affordability. This comes up all the time. Why are, are p uh, builders and developers building offices now? Lots of them. They're not building housing which is in such need. And the answer has to be it, they can make more profit doing that. So we need a change in policy to address that. Uh, the whole issue of the housing standards, the solstice dictate of, of uh, Minister Kelly was based on affordability, that it would make houses more affordable. There is absolutely no evidence for that. So we need, we need to see the information from the CIF of how much it costs to build a house, and where the hidden costs are, and I agree with Emer at the back there. I think a lot of it is in the land, and the land tax has been mentioned many times. I think we need to go beyond land tax. We need to acquire the land, and that comes back to Doug's point over here about infrastructure. Housing is infrastructure, it should be seen as such. When the roads needed to be built, there was no problem compulsorily uh, acquiring the land from farmers, often splitting farms in half in that case. So that's what needs to happen. You can try tax for a year or so. If, if it's not happening, the government should compulsorily purchase the land at a reasonable cost and make it available to uh, groups and people, including local authorities, uh, who can build. And I think that call should come from as wide a spectrum of groups as possible, including the, uh, the Royal Institute of Architects in Ireland. Thanks, Jim. Okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to, it falls to me to close this event. We've run a little bit over. Um, but okay, um, so I suppose um, we've heard a lot about uh, 
many facets of the problem that we currently face, the, the, the challenge that we face, but I think we've also actually heard an awful lot of um, very exciting and interesting and radical, in many cases, uh, proposals about how we might move forward. Uh, in that sense, I think it's been an extremely bracing but energizing, the equivalent of a good walk or something like that, a couple of hours uh, on a Saturday morning. I've learned a huge amount, and I've also felt that it's a very good way uh, for the university to operate, that it's a discussion that's looking out beyond the institution uh, and trying to think about how to act. And for me, therefore, it feels much more like the beginning of something um, and a challenge for how we move forward rather than uh, a thing that, that, that sort of stops here. I particularly would like to thank, um, Fanula mentioned the kind of orchestration of the speakers. I was thinking, not to be facetious about it, but it's something like putting together a great album that you have to think about how you get one speaker to follow the next. And somehow it felt like listening to a great album this morning um, with each speaker doing something different, but somehow linking to what had come before. And I think that falls particularly to Orla Murphy and Emmett Scanlon, who were instrumental in putting together this event. Um, and I would really like to thank them as well as Katie O'Neill uh, for their work in making all of this possible. So thank you. And of course, many, many thanks to all of our speakers uh, as well. I think I would just like to hand over to Orla at this stage for a final word. Thanks, Hugh. I won't keep you more than a minute, but I really just wanted to say a big thank you from my own point of view. Uh, particularly to all of our panellists today who came on board on a Saturday morning in June on the morning of a major football match which is going to start shortly. Um, so I really just want to thank you very much for your considered uh, responses to the questions sticking to the time. Um, thank you very much particularly to Shelley and Lorcan for also for responding to the exhibition. I want to thank our master's students for pulling together the exhibition um, and obviously my colleagues for uh, working on pulling that exhibition together and this event and finally Katie and Rebecca particularly in uh, over in the marketing department for making it all look so professional. We usually do this much more kind of off the cuff kind of way but this is uh, it felt much more professional today so thanks to them. Um, enjoy a picnic I think outside uh, the match is being shown on flat screens over in the main campus and there's loads of other things going on all day um, throughout the whole campus. So thank you very much for coming um, and we hope to see you again very soon.